Awesome and great. Um, okay, yeah, thanks, Ravi. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. That works. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a blob formula for like, I don't know, virtual Donaldson invariants, or you could call them Donaldson Mochizuki invariants. So this is like not entirely standard terminology. Um, so this is joint work with Yuji Tanaka. Um, okay, so just to for you what to expect. So the talk will have like four kind of parts. And first, this will be like a little bit introductory. So what are like just say what are these Donaldson invariants? And so they are like originally analytic. Like what is a like and then there's like an algebraic definition, and we're just kind of like uh, we won't go into the analytic part very much, but we'll just kind of look at like where do they come from, what do they do, and maybe why do we care about those them, and then what's like the difference between the analytic and algebraic invariants. And so it turns out there's like some kind of blow up formula which relates these invariants so on an algebraic surface to the blow up of that surface, and this blow up formula is important in order to compare the analytic and algebraic ones. And then, um, yeah, then we kind of go into more like the little bit technical parts, but it's it starts off like kind of in like leisurely. We look at like okay, well, like what happens to stable sheaves on the, like when we like blow up an algebraic surface? Um, like how can we compare sheaves on the surface with sheaves on the blow up? And then finally, we kind of maybe look a little bit into like the proof of our main result. Um, okay. So yeah, let me start with like Donaldson invariants. So those were kind of defined in ancient times by Donaldson, like 1989. And then there were like important like like results and kind of studies of them by like a variety of people, like Friedman Morgan did something, um, Kronheimer Mroka, Intuitual Stern, for example. Um, so they kind of expanded the definitions and like studied the structure of those invariants. And okay, and there's like certainly other people that I'm forgetting here. Um, so the basic setting is we're on a smooth, compact, simply connected and oriented four manifold. And then <clears throat> you kind of look at the, so just to recall, like the second cohomology group has a pairing in that case, just by kind of um, the usual pairing on forms. And then you have the fundamental class in dimension four. And over the reals, this kind of, you can diagonalize that. And then there's like some positive part and some negative part. And so we kind of, uh, so that, that's like the number of positive eigenvalues over the reals and that's the number of negative eigenvalues. So together these gives like the signature. Um, and so we, so in the, in what follows, I will kind of sometimes identify on the four manifold, the cohomology um, with the homology in like a shifted degree. So, so by Poincare duality, these groups are isomorphic and sometimes I will kind of, there's some danger that I will use this without kind of saying it. Um, okay, so Donaldson's original definition here, it works for um, if this B plus, the positive part, is bigger or equal to one and odd. And so what you need to do, you pick like a generic metric, a Riemannian metric on the manifold. And then these Donaldson invariants are basically a machine. So they you put in some cohomology classes. So let's say, for example, like the way it was originally defined, you take like things in H2 and you take like the, this kind of the Poincare dual class of a point in H4. Uh, 
Um, and then it spits out, so you can take that like k times, and then you kind of plug this into the machine. Here, the point of this like dot here is kind of more symbolic. It doesn't mean multiplication or anything. And you get out a rational number. So it's like a way to produce rational number from like a manifold once you chose like a generic metric. Um, okay, so this metric looks kind of a little bit maybe unsatisfying. So it looks like it's an invariant of a Riemannian manifold. Um, so for example, if B plus is actually bigger than one, you can show this is actually independent of the metric. And what you get is actually a smooth invariant of X. And so the future of this is it can help you distinguish between like smooth structures on like a given given like topological for manifold. Um, and maybe recall, or like, if you didn't know this, then like, no, you know, no. Um, so the topological classification of four manifolds, it's kind of like you can say some things, like does work by Friedman. Um, where you can like actually like say some kind of reasonable things, at least in the simply connected case. And this, so that classification is like kind of fine. And the smooth classification is like, even nowadays is like very hard. And, um, and you have like a lot of like very, you have like a lot of kind of forays where you can like say some things, but in general, you don't like really know how things look like. And so these Donaldson invariants give you like one tool to like distinguish between like, um, like maybe you're given two smooth manifolds, you know, they're like homeomorphic and it gives you, you wanna know are they diffeomorphic and this Donaldson invariants they sometimes allow you to say, well, they're not diffeomorphic because they have different Donaldson invariants. Um, so, yeah, so let's maybe look at some concrete examples here. So for example, you have like something, it's called the connected sum theorem. Um, so if X is a simply connected complex projective surface and X is like a connected sum, two manifolds and here we like take the connected sum in the sense of like both manifolds have an orientation and there's like notion of orient oriented and smooth connected sum so we get another oriented smooth manifold um, and then so so this is like this is a different morphism then one of y1 and y2 has a negative definite intersection form. Um, and so, okay, you can believe, so there's actually, there are easy examples where this does happen. So you have like, you, where you can have like, for example, if you blow up X, then it decomposes as a connected sum of just X and CP2 bar. Um, and this is like an example where this theorem, where you have a decomposition and then the conclusion of the theorem also holds because CP2 bar has a negative definite in intersection form. Um, and for example, another application is if you have X a K3 surface, then you can conclude, if you have like a direct a connected sum decomposition, then one of them, one of the factors here has to be homotopic, like has homotopy type of like an S4. So in some sense, it's kind of topologically more or less trivial. 
Um, so in some sense, there's like no kind of real decompositions of a K3 as a connected sum of two like smooth manifolds. Um, and so there's also, so this may be one first application and there's like a lot of consequences of this theorem. This was like Donaldson's original theorem. Um, but there's also applications to the, to the smooth classification in some sense of, of algebraic surfaces. So there's this complex classification by Kodaira. Um, and so this is by Friedman Morgan. And basically what it says is like, okay, if you take all algebraic surfaces over the complex numbers and you uh, kind of look at the components when you like identify things that can be deformed into each other over like a complex space. And so this is like a finer classification than if you look at them like up to their different, like up to their smooth structures. So up to diffeomorphism. And then their result was this is finite to one and they kind of used Donaldson invariance to show this. Um, yeah, basically you have like maybe different, the issue is you have like a lot of maybe complex structures which have like the same intersection form and you can't really know are the smooth structures actually different, but then using Donaldson invariance, they were able to show this. Um, yeah, so, and maybe one caution is this was kind of all the original results and they had like more, more like applications, but a lot of the applications were then superseded by Zybergritten theory. In some sense, cybergritten theory maybe wouldn't have been so successful if you hadn't already studied the Donaldson invariance in the first place. Um, so cybergritten theory is like another form of invariant, which is kind of less motivated than the Donaldson invariance, but it's easier to it's easier to actually show things because the analytic tools work out better. Um, do you have any questions at this point? Okay. Um, so now let's look at like how to actually define the Donaldson invariance. And let's kind of go more into the algebraic setting. So I kind of hint at what you need to, what the, how it worked in the analytic world, but um, since we're kind of mostly focusing on uh, the algebraic invariance, we'll kind of get to that. So we'll mostly write things down for those. So, okay, now X should be a complex projective surface and we fix some, First and second churn class, and also like an ample line bundle. And so, roughly, the idea is we look at the moduli space of coherent sheaves, abbreviated MX. With rank two and the churn classes given by C1 and C2. Um, and then assume we have like a universal sheaf. On the product of X with the modular space. Then you can do the following. So we will we also let like alpha be um, a cohomology class on X. And then we can define mu of alpha. Um, so we push forward to, so we construct some class on the product and then push forward to the modulate space. And the class we construct is what we just pull back alpha. And then we intersect with, with some Churn class of the universal sheet. Um, so there's some kind of 
something there's some reason why this is like the right thing to write down but in the end we we basically we just want to intersect with some churn class of the universal sheaf um and we get like a churn class of the same kind of degree in sorry we get like a cohomology class of the same degree in hi of the modular space um and then for the donaldson invariant so now we take just like any So let's say each of them is like uh, homogeneous. Then we just take like a bunch of these in Hx of V and we define the Donaldson invariance. So here, let's say we fix the first churn class. So uh, Nicholas has a question, which is where does it, why is there a universal sheet? Like your space is uh, of stable things and they've got GM automorphism. So there may or may not be a universal Yeah, sheet. so um, there's like several workarounds. So you can either um, the one I prefer is like you work with an orientation, so you work with oriented sheaves, and then you work with a moduli stack, which is a DM stack. Um, and on that, you just have a universal sheaf kind of by fiat. And the definition of uh, the definition of orientation is the data of exactly like uh, you're rigidifying it. Like, is that what that is that? Well, the different like, um, so there's a universal sheaf on the Artin stack of stable sheaves, but that's kind of geometrically not a nice enough object and then you add an orientation which is basically in some sense it's like a trivialization of the determinant of that sheaf right and that gives you a gm bundle over this artin stack and then it gives you like a dm stack on which you can work and where you have a universal sheaf and there's also workarounds where like you can still make this here make sense um it's basically because it's invariant under tensoring with a line bundle um and then, so the universal sheaf is kind of well-defined up to tensoring with a line bundle. And then this class here, uh, I believe it still just makes sense. So it can be expressed in terms of like the, um, yeah, in, in terms of some object which actually does descend to the moduli stack space from the moduli stack. Does it answer the question? Maybe, okay. Yeah, I'm happy. Um, yeah, so, and sometimes there is also just like a universal sheaf around, so then you can just define it like on the nose without thinking about orientations. Um, yeah, so thank you. And so, right, so once we have this, then we can like define the Donaldson invariant to be just the integral over the moduli space here. Um, And we just take this mu of every of each of the guys here. Um, so let's okay. So in the original setting, we had maybe all the alphas were in H two, and we had like some insertion here of the point class, and then you would just do like this, and then you integrate it over the modulate space. And so here, kind of, I fixed C one here, um, and then C two. Such that to C two such that like the dimension of the moduli space uh, matches up with the cohomology class here. Um, so are so are these things sort of the actual Donaldson invariants or the algebraic versions of Donaldson invariants? What's the what is what is it? So this is kind of this is kind of the general recipe. This is like the schematic how you construct Donaldson invariants. Right. Um, and I'm like except so Donaldson invariants. I'm suppressing, suppressing sufficiently many details so that you. You run into technical troubles both on the analytic and the algebraic side, um, but you can like deal with the technical troubles on both sides in some way. But so that's the idea. So that's the, basically everything I'm saying now is kind of how you want to do it, and then there's issues with it. Um, so here in Donaldson's original definition, C1 was just zero, um, but then later you can like assume. This is not the case. So here, this dimension is actually, I'm kind of lying, it's just the expected dimension. Um, and it's given by, so if you want a real dimension, it's like given by two times the complex dimension and you have like an explicit formula. So you see it's like, whenever you increase C2 by one, it jumps by four and so, 
if you can match it up, like if you can make two C2 so that the degrees match up, then like you can make this integral kind of, you can hope to make this integral work. And if it doesn't match up, then you just say the invariant is zero. If like it matches, it doesn't match up for any C2. Um, okay, so that's why C2 doesn't go into like the definition of the invariant here. Oh, so Nicholas, yeah. can I interrupt? Yeah. Uh, so in this case, you actually choose a stability condition such that the semi-stable shifts coincide with the stable shifts, right? Um, I will do that, yeah. So, so this kind of, because this is like the idea how you do it. Um, and now let's say, let me say the problems. Okay, thank you. And, yeah. Like what issues do you run into when you want to do this, right? So algebraically you run into the following issues. If you want to do it just like the way I said with like stable sheaves. Um, so maybe issue one here is like the moduli space may not actually be of the expected dimension. And it may not have like a, so this integral I of course mean you have a cohomology class, you pair it against the fundamental class of the space, and then you get something in the top degree, like then you get some integer uh, and then you're happy. But if you don't have a fundamental class, you can't do that. And then, um, yeah, so it may not have a, and here the other issue is, let's call this two, um, so it's a little bit unclear what to do. When there are properly semi stable sheaves. Then the original modular space is not proper and somehow. Um, yeah, so you can add the semi stable sheaves and you get like a proper moduli space, but you can't make a proper moduli stack. So there's like real issues with like getting universal sheaf and getting things to work. Um, so somehow in analysis, so the analyst would just say, okay, so the moduli space not, may not be of the right dimension and it may like be highly singular or something. So they just say, okay, you take a generic metric G. Um, and then the modular space will be smooth. So they don't worry about that too much. Um, uh, actually, a question is: Does the is the maybe this is the things they don't worry about? But is the does the moduli space always end up finite dimensional? Um, yeah. Well, it's it's like they have their own version of the moduli space. It's not actually sheaves, but it's like you fix like. You, like after you fix a churn class corresponds to fixing some principal SO3 bundle. And then you look at the moduli space of like certain connections on that, which, which solve like something called the anti-self duality equations. Um, and that is actually finite dimensional. And like those things, things correspond. It's a little bit, uh, yeah, it's a little bit like a journey to say how exactly they correspond, but you can, you can make it precise. Um, so they kind of, okay, so they don't worry about this point. Then here, it's also a little bit in, unclear. But ultimately, they can deal with it. So they put a lot of work into this. Um, and here for the stable sheaves. So one, one issue that they have that we don't have is like, they don't know what the sheaf is. Like, I guess they don't know what, do know what the sheaf is, but like, for us, the sheaf is kind of like a vector bundle with singularities, and they don't know what a singularity is, I guess. Um, I guess they, they know, but like it doesn't just work as nicely as for us. Um, so they kind of don't work with like the geese. So they kind of just say, okay, let's just take the space of vector bundles in some sense. And plus, uh, plus the Uhlenbeck compactification of that one. So this is somehow their way of dealing with like singular objects. 
and um, okay, so for us here for two, we just say, okay, um, let's just assume for for us what we do. So we just assume this, um, like the pairing of the given C1 with the uh, with the ample line bundle is an odd number. And then in that case, slope stability equals like the, the usual Giesecker stability and there's no strictly semi-stable sheaves. So that kind of, it restricts us to like some, to like not the general case anymore, but kind of, so maybe we can extend our result later to that case, but for now we have to assume that, um, but it gets rid of this issue completely. Um, and that's answering you's question. And then for one, um, so there's like two approaches here and kind of one is like, you just assume that C2 is large compared to like C1. So you can still kind of define invariance as long as you plug in enough stuff. Um, and then it's a fact that the moduli space is generically smooth and irreducible. So then you get a good fundamental class and you can define everything. This was kind of done by Lee and O'Grady, I guess, separately. Um, so, so then you kind of proceed like topologically and you can actually compare with the analytic invariants and it gives you the same things. So in this case, I remember that it's uh, smooth and irreducible, but it's even, I guess it's of the right dimension as well, you're saying, or you're hinting. Oh yeah. So a generic, a generic vector bundle, a generic sheaf will have like no obstructions, right. I think. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and so, right, so for, there's another way, which is in some sense more elegant. And it's like these spaces have actually a virtual fundamental class, which always lives in the right dimension. Um, so this was kind of performed by Mochizuki. Well, okay, in some sense, it's like trivial once you have the definition of a virtual fundamental class and the theory in place. Um, what Mochizuki did is actually, um, it's a little bit like, so his definition is like more, uh, it's like a little bit like more uh, involved because he also, he also makes a definition like with the case where like semi-stable objects are not all stable. Which uh, Mochizuki is this? So this is um, the other Mochizuki. Um, no. Not a good answer. Okay. I'm, I'm confusing Takuro. them right now. I'm guessing Takuro, maybe not. You Takuro, can yeah, 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 right. T. Thank you very much, thanks, yeah. Um, yeah, so, all right. So, and then like, let's call this here, for example, like Mochizuki invariance. Um, how, do, how did we like, okay, maybe let me say like one word for the virtual class. Um, so what do you do there? So the modular space, So we're still assuming here uh, there are no semi-stable objects, then it carries a perfect obstruction theory. And some of the point is, okay, um, like if you choose like one particular sheaf here, then you have the tangent space at this point uh, is equal to First X group of that sheaf with itself, and the obstruction space. Let me switch that here, I guess, is equal to the second X group of that space. Um, and you can kind of make make this like this works in some sense globally over the modular space. 
and this gets a little bit technical how this exactly works. Um, but it gives you a virtual class. In dimension. Like the first the x one minus the x two here and dropping the e e. And that's just the if you calculate that that just gives you back the expected dimension. Um, and so the fact that you get this virtual class is like by now standard. So I, it's so Litian and Berend von Tecki gave like slightly different approaches. Um, or very different, I don't know. So, uh, Sorry, yeah. Can I ask a question? Maybe maybe my question is, is, is a bit like a detailed, oh. but I'm, I'm curious, like in, in the much Zuki's paper, yeah. So you said that so he can like deal with the kind of the case when the semi-stable is not really equal to the stable, right? But the but the trick here, so but the trick he used is 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 the trick he used the, the same as like uh, as, as some like like stable pairs or something like that. Uh, it kind of is, yeah. He uses like Bradlow pairs, which is like you choose like you take a modular space of like that thing with like a map from like a very negative line bundle. Okay. And then this, this introduces some extra data which rigidifies the thing. And then you can define the variant on that and you kind of divide out by, by yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, because recently I was reading the Dominic Joyce paper. Yeah, he proposed a kind of way of generalizing the Donaldson Thomas invariance. So when the case happens that the semi stable doesn't really maybe to discuss this more afterwards, maybe. Uh, sure. just a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um okay, so so basically we get this virtual class here and one important point is like the higher x groups are actually zero so this kind of only works for surfaces um and it kind of trivially works for curves i guess so this is like you can check this using kind of the right version of stair duality um and so here's the kind of the fundamental fact is like for large c2 all approaches give you the same thing Um, so because then like the Lee O'Grady approach here gives you some number, you can show that number is like the same as the analyst's number. And it's kind of like by fiat, the same as Mochizuki's thing. Um, because then the virtual fundamental class is just a regular fundamental class. C2 is large enough. Um, so what about smaller values of C2? Um, okay, so there, it turns out in order to answer that, one way to do it is like to show a blow up formula for the Mochizuki's invariance. Um, and so maybe let me go first into like the original blow up formula for the analytic invariance. So now we still have our algebraic surface, we consider the blow up of that surface in a point. Um, and C is the exceptional curve. Then what, so we take like in a bunch of like homology classes in H star of X Z. And so we consider them as homology classes on the blow up by pulling back also. So then Friedman and Morgan tell you, okay, so we can just take these cohomology classes and evaluate the Donaldson invariant on the blow up. So they're all pulled back from X. And that's just equal to the original um, invariant. Okay, so that's good to know. Um, it's maybe not like not super surprising because somehow it doesn't really involve the geometry of the blow up. Um, they tell you a little bit more. So if you try to so what, what's new on the blow up? Well, it's just like the exceptional divisor. So you can try to insert that. Um, you will get zero if you take like this once, twice, or three times. And then the cool thing is you can, if you take it four times, what you get is um, again the Donaldson invariance invariant of the original classes times minus two. 
Um, so this is a little bit maybe un unclear where that comes from. Um, in analysis, basically what you do is like, okay, the blow up is like a connected sum and you have some way of like computing Donaldson invariance of a connected sum from each of the pieces in like easy cases. In this case, you can do it. Um, and here the future is, so this is defined as some integral over a moduli space of this form. Um, well, this guy is defined as an integral over a moduli space. So here we inserted like four times this guy. Um, this like increases the complex temp like the complex degree of the cycle by four. And so this means for this integral, we need to increase the second chunk class, and then it's over X set. Um, so here it's an integral over this space, while this guy is an integral over this. And the thing is the second chunk class increases by one. So this has been known for the analytic invariants for a long time. Since like ancient times. And so for the algebraic invariants, um, it's like, it's been harder. And so kind of, but the future of this, it allows us to increase C2. So we get into this range where the invariants agree. Um, okay, I should use my quotes here and not here. Um, so you may protest, okay, so we're increasing C2 indeed, but we're also changing the surface. Um, and that's a valid protest, but it's like, it still works. Like you can, you need to show that, but somehow, you will still end up in in like the situation where these things agree by doing this a bunch of by doing this operation a bunch of times. Um, so basically, you want to compute the right hand side, and you do it by like equating it to the left hand side, and then dividing that by minus two, and then doing that a bunch of times for like several blow ups, and then you increase your C two enough, and you get this like equality. Um, so basically, that's the corollary. If you can establish this blow up formula for Mochizuki's invariance, this will imply that the Mochizuki invariants are the analytic ones. So here, this has kind of been shown in some way in some cases by Goethe and Nakajima Yoshioka. Um, so they showed some structure theorem. So it's quite a deep result and very involved. So they showed a structure theorem for Mochizuki's invariance for um, X simply connected. with geometric genus at least one. And this implies, um, basically it implies what Shizuki's agree with the analytic invariance. And also shows the blow up formula. So in this case where PG is bigger equal to one and X is simply connected. Um, Okay, are there any questions? No. Okay, um, so the result by Tanaka and me is basically the blow up formula holds. Um, so we have to assume something else. We have to assume HC1 is odd. Um, and, but without any restrictions on X, basically. You just have to, right, so we only have this restriction. You can take any surface, you can take uh, any polarization which satisfies this. And our approach is kind of direct. It's like not a part of the theorem. And it's, it's indeed based on ideas of Nakajima and Yoshioka.
but we kind of generalize their ideas and like make it work in like a general way. Um, okay, so let me, so I'll try to say like- <laughs> Wait, sorry, okay. I have a question. Yeah. So yeah. is this, is this done in the case where, oh no, sorry, forget it. Sorry, I, I was a brain fart, sorry. Okay, <laughs> no worries. Um, if there's a question after all, let me know. Um, so yeah, okay, let me move on and let me just like- Actually, I think, there, actually, I think no. there is a question, but it's actually from Arnav. Yeah. Oh. Uh, great. I'm being volunteered to ask a question. Uh, so usually in this theory, you have this whole assumption on B2 plus the self dual says second Betty number. Yep. And it, it looks like in the GNY theorem you just stated this, yeah, it comes from PG greater than equal to one. Are, are you getting around this now? And you're able to prove something even in like the B2 plus, not that case? Well, I mean, what's, what's the, like what's the leftover case is like, so for algebraic surfaces, B2 plus is always one at least. And PG bigger or equal to one says B2 plus is at least three. So the only new case for us is like not simply connected. Then right. you need to fix the determinant and PG equals zero. Right. And but but in that case, we have wall crossing of the invariance, right? Yeah, but it's somehow the wall crossing is like if you vary the polarization on X, right? But then the you excellent. I like see. some of the blow up is just like it's like something it's ahead and just okay. Just awesome. doesn't care about that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so that's why this our direct approach is nice. You don't need like this deep structure for the invariance where you actually need things to be like you need a lot of things to go right for it to have that. Um, but their result is, of course, amazing. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, what, what I maybe this will be the last part. Um, but what I yeah want to maybe convey to you is like kind of the idea like of Nakajima Yoshioka's thing that we then use to um, to like show show this result in general. Um, so again, here we have the blow up of X at a point, point X, C is the exceptional curve. Um, so what we wanna do is we wanna just compare these moduli spaces um, of sheaves on the blow up so the set of sheaves on the blow up, which are like stable with respect to like some churn classes. So here just consider C1 is just pulled back from X itself. And on the other hand, let's call this space here M0. Um, it's just a space of sheaves pulled back from, so this is like isomorphic to MX where so it's just all the all the sheaves which are pullbacks of stable sheaves on X. Um, okay, that seems like very naive, and it's in some sense it's very naive. They kind of didn't. This kind of didn't come to be like this, but I th it, you can actually kind of just look at these. Um, we want to compare these two spaces. But um, is this now this M upper zero? Is this just a set of sheaves? Well, it's like a space. It's like it's it's still like it's still like a moduli space of these guys. It's like an open. You can show it's like an open subset of like this stack of all sheaves or something like that. And maybe the word "like" in that sentence is the California use of the word that doesn't actually. I mean, it's an actual moduli space. It's all right. That's it's it's sorry. Yeah, it's a moduli space. Yeah. Um, well, I don't I don't define it like that when I write things down, but it's like you. Um, yeah, so you define it in a way and it's like contains exactly those sheaves. And it's like an open condition to be a pullback of a sheaf. This is all like non trivial that this works, I guess. Um, yeah. So you can write down some conditions which make sure you get such a space which is isomorphic to the space of sheaves downstairs. Um, okay, so here, okay, on X hat. One thing I should remark here, we choose a polarization. So we choose an ample line bundle, which is essentially you take this guy. Um, so you take the polarization given to you on X and then that like is positive on every curve except on C itself. So you subtract like a small multiple of C because C has negative self intersection. And then it's actually an ample line bundle. Uh, and epsilon here is sufficiently small. Um, 
Okay, you need to like, okay, this will just be a rational divisor, but everything is fine. Um, okay, so let's let's like start comparing these guys. So suppose f is locally free at x. Then this pullback is um, a stable sheaf on x set. Why? Um, because it's slope stable and torsion free. And it's slope stable just kind of because of the way we chose the divisor and um, we knew it's slope stable downstairs because semi-stable equals stable in our case. So uh, because like our condition on the first turn class. So we're like, okay, we're putting us in a nice situation. So things like work out more than they would in like a less nice situation. Um, okay, so if F is not locally free, um, then P star F automatically has a non-trivial version part. Um, and it's, it'll only be at C because outside of CP is an isomorphism. Um, so actually the best example to look at is like in the rank one case. So actually you can always embed F into locally free by taking the double dual. Um, let's just consider like the special kind of case where we have a rank one ideal sheaf. Um, so you just pull that back. So you get an exact sequence of this form you get L1 P star of like the structure sheaf of a point, then you get zero. Um, and then here, if you like kind of figure that out, what that is, you actually get OX hat of minus C, so line bundle um, P star IX here. And so you can also calculate, this is just OC of minus one. Okay, so we get a torsion sheaf um, and you can be disturbed by that or you can just, deal with it and, and work with it. Um, right, so in some sense, okay, this is like a new object. Um, what would we expect? Like what would we expect on the other side? Um, what should correspond to that object somehow on the other side? Like, so this is here, we have this object P star I X. Okay, ignore that we're like changing ranks here, but uh, on the other side, what kind of object would we want? Well, you can think about if you have like, um, maybe you have some points like Y, which go to X, and then here P star I Y. So this guy would like go to P star I X, and this on M zero. But then if you work on M one, on sorry on M X hat, what you would have here is okay. This is just I Y. So it's just like an ideal sheaf in its own right. If like Y is not equal to X. And then what this approach is, is like some other ideal sheaf with like, so you have some more data here. You get like to, you get to like, it approaches some point on X maybe, like at some point lying on C. Um, and so, okay, so really kind of, we wanna exchange all these ideal sheaves with like objects, which are with like this kind of object. Um, Maybe let me salvage all of this here. Try to. Uh... All right. So, um, so this is the kind of object we would like to have on the other side, whereby prime is like lies on C. Um, and this kind of object, it sits like in an, so you can restrict it to C and then it's like kind of an ideal sheaf on C of a point. And the kernel of this will be OX of minus C. Of X of minus C. Um, so you see kind of, you get these both, both of these things are like extensions of OC of minus one and some line bundle. And they kind of differ by the way in which you take the extension. So one time, so this here will give you something in M zero. And so the middle object will be in M X set here. Um, okay, so maybe let's, 
make this observation, we can get a stable sheaf. Um, even though we started out with something where the pullback was not stable on XZ, we could get something nice by removing the torsion. And like in some sense reattaching from the right. And in some sense, this is like how wall crossing works in general. Um, so you have some destabilizing object and then you take it and you just put it like you kind of try to put it again there from the other side. Um, so let's kind of write, write this out in some kind of global way here. What, so what did we do? So we have M0 and we have the space on the blow up and these guys here have no torsion. And these guys here, so this is a set of pulled back sheaves. They have some torsion. Um, but you can still show HOM of OC into E has to be zero for one guy in there. Um, so that's kind of, we relax some condition, but then, so we're adding more stuff, but we don't want to add more stuff to a proper space without also taking something out. So we want to also have some extra condition. And if you kind of look at it, you see these already satisfy that this is zero, this space is zero. Um, and so like, why is this true? So this is just because kind of by injunction. Okay. Um, yeah, and again, also this condition here just means this kind of implies it's kind of equivalent that P star E is torsion free. And this will be equivalent to P star to this guy. Uh, sorry, if you if it's like E is pullback of F, then this is just this guy. So it's just actually equal to F by the projection formula. Um, okay, so we, yeah, so we like got M0 basically by relaxing the torsion condition a little bit, but then imposing some other condition, which kind of uh, determines which kind of quotients it can have. <clears throat> and so more generally what you can do So if you have like some sheaf like this, um, and suppose it's like not stable, then maybe it has like some OC of minus one in the distortion part. Um, and then you can try to attach that again from the right hand side here. Well, in some sense, that's the only flavor that can go wrong, like, or some variant of that. Well, yeah, so you can kind of do that until there's no. So if you do that like a number of times, you will have no OC of minus one torsion here. Um, and then you can kind of go with, but maybe it has some OC of minus two torsion. And then you can again bring those over. And then you can kind of keep going and then at some point it will have like no torsion. So you get some guy. So you don't have to take to do infinitely many steps, but you will at some point you just get rid of all the torsion and you're you're done. Um, and then this is stable on next set. So okay, so basically. 
what we want to do now is like make this procedure into like some we just kind of don't want to talk about single sheets. We want to talk about moduli spaces. Um, and we had this guy, which had like, it can have OC of minus ones as torsion, uh, but no, no, just like, uh, not just the structure sheet of C. But on the other hand, we're like here requiring this condition. And then that P star is like, And then after bringing all the OC of minus ones over, we can uh, say, okay, now this is zero. So we eliminated this torsion part. Okay, but we have to allow that it could have like maps to an OC of minus one because that's kind of how we built them. Um, okay, so you can go like that and then the general guy here, and we're still requiring this guy to be slope stable. And here we will like end up with like this guy twisted by M, sorry. And so we relax, we relax the second condition. And so the nice thing here is, um, so you can do this and you only need to do this a bounded number of times. For like fixed churn classes, and then you will actually remove have removed like there will won't be any torsion sheaf like any sheaves with torsion part left, and you will get like um, you'll end up with the moduli space of just like stable sheaves on XZ. Um, and so basically, what we do is so the strategy we follow here is like okay, so this gives you like a way to compare sheaves on X and sheaves on XZ and we kind of want to prove a wall crossing result. For the invariance um, on those spaces. So that relate the invariance on each space. Um, and so maybe let me conclude. So. Yeah, so we, what we show is, okay, if you have a polynomial in, so we have like a kind of expression in churn classes. So kind of like the Donaldson invariance, but it works like in quite a bit more generality. So what we mean is you can be any kind of base. And so given a sheaf on U times X hat, then this produces a cohomology class on U. And in some kind of universal, in some kind of like nice way. So here for Donaldson invariance, could be um, mu of, just we really take the different like mu of alpha one to alpha n, and then we can take some number of like mu of c. And this each mu depends on the universal sheaf. So the E kind of goes into that. Um, and then we have like an explicit formula that expresses these uh, invariants on each space here. Um, so let me just write down, so it's like a sum of terms and let me just like write down the first term and then not explain it for time reasons. Um, so here, so basically it's like an integral over moduli space with like some kind of smaller churn classes in some sense. And here you take this kind of formal expression using some equivariant methods. Um, 
Okay, and here you take the Euler class of something which is kind of, it's like the, uh, it's basically some sheaf of homomorphisms from E to OCF minus M, but again, tensored with this guy. Okay, and then here plus like, in some sense, higher order degree. Which are of the same form, but a little bit more complicated. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm going to stop here. And yeah, thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, we can unmute ourselves and then thank Nick for an uh, enlightening talk. Thank you. So, any any further questions or comments to add to the doc? I I have a question. Um, so in this last formula, it's between the, <clears throat> so you have the sequence of Moly spaces and this is the difference of the integral on two consecutive ones, correct? Yep. That's right. So is it clear that for for large M somehow the difference is zero or? Um, yeah, so this moduli space will have virtual dimension of this guy is like, is equal to the virtual dimension of like the original guy. Um, it doesn't matter which one I take, they have the same dimension, minus something that grows in M. Say it like this. Okay, all right. And okay, but you don't want to do this formula when it's negative, I suppose. <laughs> well, it, it's like, okay, right? It's just like, it will be zero when, when the dimension is negative. Then you know- Oh it's yeah, like, okay. It's yeah, okay. even better. You do want to do one when it's zero. <laughs> so the formula is really has like infinitely many terms. And then in every given situation, it's like, okay, you can like, you can like, everything makes sense in every given situation. But it makes it also hard to deal with it. So for Donaldson invariance, we could really use this to show the blow up formula, basically because you only have to worry. So these guys just kind of, they just drop out of the formula. You can just kind of take them out of everything. Um, and you only have to worry about this. And this only kind of gives you issues up to like co-dimension four. And there's only one term which will contribute to that. <clears throat>